Supposing you had the chance to get rid of some of your worst nightmares, what would they be? My guest is here tonight to persuade me to banish the items on his list to Room 101. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Jonathan Ross? <laughs> People very genuinely pleased to see you there. I think I think they were just startled by the suit. <laughs> <laughs> so did it take you a long time to come up with these? No, well, you most of them actually genuinely quite heartfelt. I was going to do um, well when you're driving and people in front of you make a sudden turn without indicating. Mm -hmm. That really annoys me. Mm. But I found having a double-barreled shotgun with me has really helped. <laughs> Well, it's the sort of thing that will happen all the time, though, won't it? It happens all the time. Motorway madness. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, move away from motorway madness, because it's got nothing to do with your first choice. But to illustrate your first choice, let's, um, let's have a look at this. Help us to save our forests. They sang to the prince about the need for ecotourism. And they brought with them a sample of their local brew, made from the root of a tree. <laughs> now, it's, just, it's not local brew. It's not local brew, and it's not the royal family per se, because no. I actually, I rather like the royal family. Do you? I'm really pleased we've got a royal family. I love the fact that we have a link with that tradition. Mm -hmm. I think they do a lot of good for the country. I just mm -hmm. don't think we should allow them to go abroad. <laughs> Ever. I mean, even for, like, holidays. Because <laughs> every time they go abroad, it's a disaster. You know, and it's not just, I mean, we'll get on to Charles and his hats abroad yeah, in yeah. a minute, if yeah. we may. <laughs> but, I mean, it's the fact that they're meant to be emissaries of goodwill. They're meant to be our ambassadors. They're meant mm -hmm. to go away. I imagine, this is what I thought, to go away so people have good, positive thoughts about us. Mm -hmm. But, no, every time they go away, when they come back, people just think we're ridiculous. It's like you have Prince Philip, who goes away, who seems to have some very advanced form of, like, royal Tourette syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> he will be in a line seeing some people, say in China, for example, and they'll be said, hello, and what do you do, slant eyes? He'll say something like that. <laughs> he'll think that's OK. Well, maybe that's why Prince Charles is all right here, because, he, you know, he, he joins in, doesn't he? He joins in with the fun. Let's have a look. <laughs> well, that was him in Jamaica, I think. See, that is so much borderline racist, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> if you give the hat, you put it on back to fun. Well done, Charles. <laughs> Let's move on from that one. <laughs> we don't know what he's doing there. Or where he is. I, I'm beginning to suspect that the people who give them those hats, they know exactly what they're doing. Exactly. They, they get, come over They've got a think, sweepstake. I bet he won't put it on. I bet he will. <laughs> it's their way of getting back at us. When mm. they go over there, they say, I'll tell you what we'll do. This is what we'll do. First of all, we'll do a dance for them and we'll claim it's a kind of traditional dance. Uh -huh. And the Queen's sitting there, quite confused. Mm. Um, and she say, why are they sticking their tongues out at us? And they'll say, well, ma'am, that's traditional. And, ah, why are they holding their arse cheeks open in front of them? <laughs> Well, ma'am, that's traditional. Why are they doing th that thing with their hands? Oh, well, they're just waving at Prince Philip. <laughs> it's a tradition. <laughs> and the Queen, bless her, she's had a difficult life. When you say she's had a difficult life, this is the Queen's rider, which is, is not a member of the household. It's something that she actually insists on <laughs> when she goes to various hotels. This is the unsuitable thing to the royal family. Yeah. Duvets. Can't have duvets. She must have cotton sheets. Because Philip breaks when under the duvet, there's hell to pay. Yeah. <laughs> he does the royal waft. Exactly. <laughs> Queen doesn't like it. Yeah. Uh, bloody meat they don't like, which I presume is, is raw meat rather than just sort of like bloody meat. <laughs> Bleed and pasta, you know. Do you think that they've been away once and someone's given Charles some bloody meat and he wore it? <laughs> well, I mean, if he wears that, he's, he, he, could, he could wear a bit of liver, couldn't he? Quite he, happily. He would wear it. You give him a liver, he'd put his head in it. If you say... <laughs> if you give him a chicken, he'd put his head in it. I dread to think what happens if he ever goes to a Thai strip club, he'll come out wearing the main attraction. <laughs> Firing ping pongs as he goes down the road. <laughs> it's how to get the backspin on it that baffles me. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, you know, the, the royal family occasionally you hear, you know, some sort of mention of the fact that we don't take them seriously, we don't treat them with respect, mm. but it's any wonder. It's like when Prince Edward went to Hollywood, I think it was only last year, mm. he went to Hollywood and he had the cheek to say, oh, oh yes. people in England don't like success, they knock people who are successful. No. Hey, how would he know? Mm. Right? <laughs> Here you've got a guy who is to film producing what Fred West was to the youth hostel business, right? <laughs> He, he's not well regarded in that field. And two, how stupid do you have to be to think, we're paying you to go aboard and say nice things about us, and the first thing you say is knocking us. Um, now, are we going to put this in the room 101? Um, I think you have to, Paul, because I've argued quite eloquently. Well, you haven't stopped talking, that's not yeah. the same. <laughs> but if you don't, I'll just carry on. <laughs> Yes, I think so. I mean, you're quite right, really. It does, it does make us look completely ridiculous. So, no, it's definitely going in room 101. God bless you. Definitely. <laughs> you. Now, your next item, Jonathan, I've got something in here which uh, amply demonstrates it. It's, uh, it's a man, it's a man's head, wearing X-ray specs, or as they're called there, X-ray gogs, 
Um, tell me what this is all about. Well, when I was a child, I was uh, I, I collected comics. I love comic books, and I used to be fascinated by the adverts in the in the middle for like strange products, mm -hmm. gimmicks you could buy. And I used to mm -hmm. be obsessed with getting them. And you, I didn't think you could send off to America and get them. And so finally, as I got a bit older, probably a bit too old, a bit too wise, I discovered that you could get these sort of things in England. Mm -hmm. The stuff you saw advertising comics, it was like X-ray specs. It was like the hand buzzer. It was the mini fan. It was the black face soap. What's, what's the mini fan? The mini fan was a small fan. I was obsessed with the mini fan for about four years. <laughs> I come from humble roots. Okay? <laughs> we couldn't afford. I didn't have any spare cash at all. I've got stories to tell you that would make you weep, buckets. <laughs> so I couldn't. We didn't have money for me to buy a mini fan. Let's face it, a mini fan is a luxury. You don't need a mini fan. You don't really need a very large fan when you're living in Leytonstone, which is in East London, which is quite cold most of the year. <laughs> so really, a mini fan for me was just a. It was a frippery. It was a mere item of luxury that I long for and I yearn for as only a young boy can. <laughs> but no, the mini fan was not to be mine because I didn't have the disposable income of, say, a wealthier boy like Steve Taylor at school who had enough money to buy a mini fan and yet Steve, of course, didn't want a mini fan. Oh, no, he didn't need a mini fan even though he could buy a mini fan. He spent his money on little models of footballers which were no use to me. But the mini fan, I crave. So... So... Um, you basically you. wanted a mini fan. I was... <laughs> even now, actually, you're opening up an old wound. <laughs> But I really wanted the mini fan. Now, I lived... Uh, I think I've mentioned the poverty. I lived in a, a house... I shared my bedroom with four brothers. Mm. You imagine what that was like when we hit 14. Mm. It, was like, it was just like a creaking hell at bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> Stop shaking the bed. That was the euphemism we employed. Yeah. <laughs> so I slept in the bunk bed above my older brother, Paul. Yeah. Who, you may say, is a purveyor of poor-quality TV shows. <laughs> A lovely bloke and a great brother. And he was below me in the bed and he would hear me often at night just pining for a mini fan. <laughs> <laughs> I actually used to talk out loud about my lust for a mini fan. I would say, I wish I had a mini fan. When will I have a mini fan? Where can I get a mini fan? Where can I get the money for a mini fan? So Paul finally cracked. He said, Why do you want a mini fan? I said, I'll tell you for why, Paul. Just look at the advert. The mini fan has 101 uses. <laughs> so Paul said, Name them. And, you know, I could only get up to about four. And for months, I tried to get past four. I'd say, well, it keeps you cool. You go, number one. Blows your hair off your forehead, number two. Keeps ice cream cool. <laughs> Cools down soup. So I didn't think of that one. Yeah. <laughs> Where were you when I needed you? Well, I don't know. Let's, uh... well, even that, we get to five. I think the yeah. fourth one I said was something like, you know, it would come in handy if an old lady faded. Yeah. It was something like that. I was trying to think of others. Finally, Paul, being very generous, did indeed buy me a minifan. The so this story has a happy ending? Well, not really, because when he turned up, I realised <laughs> that the minifan that I had lusted and put so much and actually transferred a lot of emotion, a lot of my personality mm -hmm. into a lot of my design, was the cheapest piece of plastic shit you have seen in your <laughs> entire life. It was this big, the battery connections didn't work properly, it was flimsy, no real fan effect, hardly any. I mean, if you went like that, you got a proper fan. <laughs> <laughs> and also, people would laugh at me. You know, I'd be at school and I'd get my minifan out and... So the mini fan was disappointing. Did you get the x-ray specs? Indeed, I finally got the x-ray specs, but quite late in life. Uh -huh. When I was a child, and I finally tracked them down, I thought, you know, I've always wondered whether you can indeed. There's a saucy picture. I don't know if you remember the picture of the advert for the x-ray specs. Well, I think let's have a look. We might oh, let's have, have a look. look. The one I remember, there were two, two adverts there. One was a bloke looking through his hand. There we are. What this an incredible a... feat of science. That's the one you got there. Yeah, x-ray specs. specs. And hilarious optical illusion. Scientific optical principle really works. Imagine you put on the x-ray specs and hold your hand in front of you. You seem to be able to look right through the flesh and see the bones underneath. Look at your friend. Is that really his body you see under his clothes? <laughs> Guess which one of those two attracted me the most? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, I mean, you, you knocked the x-ray specs, but let's have a look. We're, we're going to put these on... Um, I'll just go over and I'll try this on... Um, I don't know if we can do this. I'll put this on camera three. And camera three will look through those x-ray specs and see if we can... See what... <laughs> You see, they work too well. Yeah. <laughs> That's not bad for a dollar, is it? So no. what else? What did you what send off? What actually happens is all you see is like a blurry outline. If I wanted that, I'd have taken my glasses off. <laughs> <laughs> so that was rubbish. And you look so silly wearing them. I mean, I would have thought you could slip them on and people wouldn't know you were wearing them. So then you're spying at them. Uh -huh. You're looking at the pubic area and you've got those on. They wouldn't know. <laughs> what a giveaway that is. <laughs> you're in a bike going, hello, do you come here often? <laughs> <laughs> you would know, wouldn't you? Immediately. Well, have a look at some of the others on this on this Actually, card. These are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> You've lost weight. I have. <laughs> uh, let's put, put those back on there. Um, let's have a look at some of the other things we got here. Oh, the atomic smoke bomb. I like the sound of that. Just light one and watch the column of thick white smoke rise to the ceiling, mushroom into a dense cloud, just like an A bomb. <laughs> That's the sort of thing that Prince Philip would give out as a joke when he toured Japan. <laughs> <laughs> 
most of this stuff we're talking about here is American stuff. Let's have a look at what the English equivalent was of this fantastic stuff that you could fire the imagination with. And I, I think this is the closest what we had, which is the, the slimline wayfinders. I don't know if you remember these shoes. These were the shoes that had a compass in the heel and also the footprints of different animals on the sole. <laughs> I wonder, you see, you've got prints here of, like, you know, little sheep, there's a fox, there's a wolf. I think this could confuse a very stupid farmer. <laughs> if you walked across his field, you think a gang of one-legged animals <laughs> are after his chickens. And he's got a compass in the heel, which I think is very, very good. I, I never had one, but they I... They were I... very sought after. Yeah, they were. I'll tell you what was even slightly more sought after at my school, were the Allen Ball football boots. Do you remember them? The white ones. Well, Allen Ball, I think, was famous for some sort of tricky manoeuvre. May I demonstrate? Go on, then. I believe it was thus. He would run, and when running at great speed, Allen Ball had somehow perfected the ability to spin on the ball of his foot with amazing dexterity. Thus, hey! Like that, confusing the players who would then run off in that direction, yeah. leaving him free to go out for the day or something. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so they developed the Allen Ball Czech uh, football boot, which had in it a small round spinning disc. <laughs> oh, remember. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah And the yeah. kids could stop and you could stop and just twizzle like that as much yeah. as you wanted. <laughs> and uh, I think they withdrew them on the market after many, many children's shin bones burst right through the flesh <laughs> during important Sunday matches. <laughs> Do you not think, though, do you not think that this American stuff gave, t gives you an important lesson in life? That in... may well be so, but now the memories still hurt and burn and, and consume me occasionally, and I may well lash out right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're definitely not going to go into room one oh, on you... No, no. Um, no, I'm not going to put it into it, because I think there's an important life lesson here. Basically, that life is sometimes crap. <laughs> and if you think X-ray specs work, then you, you don't know enough about life. But you know, Paul, that's a lesson I've still to fully learn. Well, you'll have to take it away with you and learn it some other time, Jonathan. Thank there you. you go. I'm sorry, you can't go in. <laughs> All right, OK, well, let's have a look at your next choice here. Um, we've got a VT which uh, demonstrates it. So, there's a dog there. So, what did you, um... <laughs> what is it here? It's not dogs exactly, is it? No, I love dogs. I like yeah. animals. I'm very big on dogs. Please don't think I do not like dogs, uh -huh. OK? I like dogs. I just cannot bear their bloody lips. <laughs> Look at that. What was, th what was our creator thinking on the day he decided to rub a small bit of sort of wet black rubber <laughs> around a dog's mouth? They're disgusting. It's like someone stuck a couple of eels on their face. <laughs> they look like, you know, when you, when you, you know, find an old sort of a bit of abandoned land and someone's chucked a fridge out and there's that bit of <laughs> old black rub around the door? Yeah. That's a dog's lip. <laughs> it's the blackness. It, it speaks of Satan. <laughs> and as we all know, dogs lick their own bollocks, OK? <laughs> I'm not saying anything you haven't all noticed and thought about, mm -hmm. yeah? OK? Mm -hmm. And this isn't jealousy on my part, cos I've looked into it and I know just removing two vertebrae, I could do that, and I've decided it really isn't worth the effort or the cost. <laughs> But they lick their own genitalia and then people let them kiss them on the mouth. Why don't they just go down on the dogs themselves and save them the world? Well, it's disgusting. It I could do be. not want to see it anymore. It could be that, as you say, a dog licks another dog's bollocks and licks our face. It could be our face is like a sorbet. <laughs> To clean the, <laughs> cleanse the palate before palate. you move on to the next dog. Yeah, well, they're not licking my face. You know, you're not meant to find dog lips attractive yourself, are you? But let, you're meant to find human lips attractive. So let's have a look at a pair of human lips. Are these attractive? <laughs> well, if you wound up with him, considering the alternative, probably yes. Well, let's try a bit of genetic engineering. Um, let's try um, his lips on a dog. <laughs> Is that more attractive to you? Yes! <laughs> Quite you simple. are here. Yes. You would say I'd kiss him. You would kiss a dog that had Michael well, Patillo's lips. I tell you why. Maybe, maybe for money. But I tell you what. <laughs> uh, the problem I would have, though. All oh, right, you fix the lips. What about the nose? Well, now on the subject, I've just noticed I don't like dogs' nose either. <laughs> They're what black, is... they're wet, they're warty. They look like something you would have biopsied if you found it growing on your own body. Is there any... I once saw a bulldog that had sneezed. It looked like someone had emptied a whole can of apple pie filling all over his face. <laughs> and then someone kissed him. <laughs> We've got... I mean, these dog's lips here, if you pull those off, you'll find those are detachable. And examine them... Uh... Now, isn't that preferable? Wouldn't that be now he's quite sweet. I still wouldn't, you know, want to kiss him because I've but seen what he's been doing yeah, with but that. Yeah, his mouth would just fray at the edges. <laughs> I wish you knew where that had been. <laughs> Put it in the room, Paul. <laughs> you really don't like dog's lips, do you? You could. What? Have I not stated my case forcefully enough? <laughs> All right, dog's lips. They're definitely going into room. Thank by you, the way. Paul. Off they go. <laughs> 
feel a victory for common me. sense. Let's move on to the next item, and we've got here something that uh, illustrates it. It's um, a cardboard cutout of uh, Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> no, it's not about Sylvester Stallone. What, what is this about? It's about certain types of movies, OK? I mean, mm -hmm. in my... The job I do at the moment, I do Film 2000, which is a great fun job to have and it's terrific fun. I love movies, I love going to see films, I like talking about films mm -hmm. and so on. But sometimes when you're in there, halfway through a movie, I get a crashing feeling of despair when I realise I know exactly how this particular movie is going to end. And nine times out of ten, it's the kind of film you'll find someone like Sylvester Stone in, a very kind of um, formularic genre movie of a certain time. And the ones I, I've really grown to loathe, and, you know, I, I like movies anyway. I mean, I even like these, sort of, but I'd mm. like to see an end put to them. That's mm. why I like them going in the room. Mm -hmm. is, the, is the kind of ones where the underdog, the plucky underdog, yes. struggles from the bottom of the heap and at the end of 90 or 100 minutes of, well, adversity... Struggle. ..difficulties, mm. bad hair and Almost so on. insurmountable obstacles. You would have thought so. <laughs> they win. <laughs> and you're there, and normally it's about ten minutes before the end, and I'm thinking, just hurry up, will you? Please, <laughs> let him win the bloody fight. I know he's going to win. He's knocked down. It's round four. There's only 30 seconds left to go. He's going to win. The film's called Rocky. It's not called Apollo Creed. Rocky's going to win. <laughs> I know that. Escape to Victory. Have you seen that film? I have. No. I recommend it highly, if you haven't, for all the wrong reasons. That is the Second World War drama in which a bunch of footballers um, go against the Nazi, against the Hun. Michael they, Caine's in it. Sylvester Stallone's in it. He's a goalkeeper. He's never even seen an English football before he made the movie. Yeah. He thought it was like a big Maltese or something. You can see. <laughs> so he did it like with the wonderment of a child. And at the end of the movie, um, not only do the plucky underdogs win, they win by, I seem to recall, and I've only seen it once, not only do they win, they had to have the American bloke win, it's an American movie, mm -hmm. which also upset me, but he wins by running from the goal with the football, dribbling past every soldier and scoring the goal in the other end. <laughs> that, a, that couldn't happen. B, I believe that's against the rules. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, you can do that. A goalkeeper can dribble up the field. Right. A, that couldn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> B, it's not against the rules. B, it should be against the bloody should rules. Be. Should be. And C, you know, you knew they were going to win. Well, you mentioned Escape to Victory there, and we've got a, 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 a little clip here from a uh, BBC children's television show from the 1970s called Striker, which we think could possibly have been the inspiration for Escape for Victory. Let's have a look at their dilemma. Listen, you what? Just because we're down to ten men doesn't mean we go out there to lose, right? We've got to work hard, cover everything. We should play for a draw. Rubbish, you mean nothing like that. We go out there to win. We had them rocking last time. We can still beat them if we try. Just push the ball around a bit and no bad passes, all right? Very good advice there for a football team. No oh, bad hang on. passes. I want to see how it finishes. Well, <laughs> you will. You will see, but let's what what do you think happens? They've got their ten men. Um, you know, would I be Far short of the mark, if I guess that maybe, against the odds, mm. they win through? They win through, but they, but they need another player. Would it be an American monkey? No. <laughs> Who turns out to be a girl. Would it be a girl played by Arnold Schwarzenegger? No. <laughs> this is BBC Children's Television, remember. Would it be a girl played by Keith Chegwin, then? <laughs> you may be closer than you think. Let's have a look. They've got to cut the hair, because, you know, otherwise people will be suspicious. Oh, what a dummy. What a class player we are This here. isn't the girl. Sweet He's baby Moses. Yeah. Here she is. Yeah. This is the best team you'll ever see, Cedric. I'm impressed. Yeah. Hey, Jackie, any score yet? 2 0 to us. Great. Now, you're a parent. Would you let either one of those two people near your children? <laughs> I wouldn't, but let's face it, the boy with the tits is asking for it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no court in the land would convict them. No. <laughs> <laughs> that really is quite bad. Although, you know, you've gone and spoiled Channel 5's autumn season by showing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's their big spectacular, isn't it? So, do you think this is an American influence, then? Is it the Americans always have to have a, have the a happy is, ending? About three, four years ago, it seemed to me that all, you know, the big budget movies all seem to stick to that particular formula. I mean, when you go and see a movie, you know, I like to go and see a film, I think, great, take me on a journey. You know, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the storytelling tradition. Show me things I haven't seen before. Involve me, engage me, move me, touch me in some way, teach me something about the human condition, or just make me laugh so much that I wet myself. Either way, I'm happy, <laughs> right? But please don't set up someone with some difficulties who, by the end of the movie, has miraculously overcome them. I mean, that's well, not a journey I'm particularly interested in taking anymore. Yeah. So I used to go... I mean, you are, you know, you're known as a film fan and a film buff. Are you seeing films now that normally you would never go to see? Absolutely, and it's quite hard to sit through them sometimes, I'll be honest, but I'm not really allowed to walk out of them. No, sure. You know, so I've now developed a form of transcendental meditation where <laughs> my physical body remains in the screening room, but I'm actually down the road at the peep show. <laughs> 
Um, is it still 50p in a little thing? <laughs> <laughs> They've given me my own booth. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have them anymore, do they? I went in one years ago, it was fantastic. There was a girl lying on a black and decker workbench and I got really excited because it was the same one my dad had. <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying, hey, my dad's got that workbench. Went, Shut up, I'm working. <laughs> OK, well, I think... I think we're going to put this in. Um, but I, I wonder if I pull it, if it, being the plucky underdog, if I pull it, it'll probably then be able to sort of crawl its way back up. Let's have a go. Into room 101. <laughs> Well done. That's it, that's the end of the plucky there underdog. OK, Jonathan, let's have a look at your uh, final choice. Now, there's you. <laughs> you don't have to groan. <laughs> I mean, I am still in the room. <laughs> why, why, why do you think they're groaning? Well, they're groaning for the same reason I've chosen this, which is basically, and I rely on your judgment here, because you've yes. been firm but fair, mm -hmm. my dress sense. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see the stuff you don't buy. <laughs> oh, there isn't any stuff I don't buy. <laughs> That's the problem. Well, let's, uh, this, that might be a one-off. Let's have a look at another picture. Oh, let's have a look at the next one. Right, that's the worst ever. <laughs> so, what, talk us through that ensemble. <laughs> you know... Somewhere uh, there's a leopard going around with a Jonathan Ross shape hole in it. <laughs> so, you've got the top here. I look at that and I just feel despair. <laughs> I'll tell you the deal with that one. I killed? can't to deal with that. That was for a premiere and I, I, I'd been away in Los Angeles. <laughs> and while I was there, I bumped into an old friend of mine who used to run a clothes shop in South Mountain Street, mm -hmm. where they sold equally ridiculous items, so I should have known better than listening to him. Mm -hmm. And he said, I've got a shop here, come and see me. I said, OK, I went in, I had a drink, it was lunchtime, I went in. Next thing I know, I'm wearing a kilt, he's persuading me I look good in it. <laughs> <laughs> that very day I had to go out to see Interview with a Vampire. That was the film, that was the premiere. Oh, I went out, now here's the problem, I went, I came home and I put it on, I said, what do you think? And Jane said, well look, I mean, if you want to wear it out, you know, express yourself. And she's very kind, she said, but you can't go out not wearing any tights, I have bare legs and some boots on. I said, well, I haven't bought any tights. She went, <laughs> wear a pair of mine, darling. <laughs> Big mistake number one. I mean, the whole thing's a mistake. I'll give you that. So I put the tights on. Now, her, they are tights you can't see through. By the time they're stretched over my big, blokey, hairy legs, they're like see-through, girly tights. <laughs> now, the worst thing about that particular night is I'll turn up with the premiere, and uh, about halfway there, I thought, this has not been a good idea. And as I got out of the car, I thought, the best thing to do is to go out very boldly, OK? Leap out boldly and, like, yeah, all right, I'm wearing a skirt. What of it? But as... <laughs> <laughs> so I leapt. But as I leapt out of the car, I tripped on the rim of the car, and I fell into the arms of a security guard. <laughs> I feel like I'm dragged up and I've leapt on the first man I've seen. <laughs> I've come out! <laughs> and this is the problem. I think I've got some sort of chemical imbalance in my brain. <laughs> I've interviewed top stars and they all look splendid. I interviewed Kevin Spacey recently. He was a dapper Dan. He looked like Jack the Biscuit. He was sitting here in a smart suit on, very dark charcoal, grey, black tie. I think it was a light pink shirt, big Oxford bow on a tie. Look fantastic, cufflinks, black shoes. That's what you want. Mm. Did you say Jack the Biscuit? <laughs> Was looking like Jack the Biscuit. <laughs> Who's Jack the Biscuit? Jack the Biscuit is a, a phrase in popular usage in my house when we play Scrabble. <laughs> Jack the Biscuit. I think the clause there is in my house. All oh, right, <laughs> not popular usage. Have you never seen Jack the Biscuit? No, no. Well, you will do from now, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try out your taste in clothes. Let's have a look at a couple of things. See, shout out whether you would have bought these or not. OK. Would you wear that? Chris oh, Eubank, what are you no, I'm not that bad, am I? <laughs> well, you know what, I wouldn't have gone with the bag, but the coat and the rest of the outfit, yeah, I'd have worn it. You'd have worn it. I see, I actually think, I'm on a few bits of who think Chris Eubanks has got really good dress sense. <laughs> <laughs> I do! What about that? The walnut whip. <laughs> well, Would you, know, you wear that? Well, don't be silly, that's for ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the tights and the skirt. So, all right, so... I'm out shopping and I see a beautiful dark Armani suit, mm. OK? And I've got some cash these days, I could afford it. Mm -hmm. And yet, in the next shop, I see something in pink lizard skin. I'm going to buy the lizard skin. <laughs> so there's a little voice inside You don't saying, care about those pink lizards don't. needlessly slaughtered? <laughs> just so you can look like Jack the Biscuit? <laughs> and it's always been with you, then, this, this poor... This... It has always been a problem, and I think I have to blame my parents. I'm going to put the blame squarely on... We, we come from a poor family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned that. They did a great job, my parents, a fantastic job. They raised six children, and they were a very, you know, standard working-class family. But I remember once they bought me a pair of training shoes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These training shoes, I've got very big feet, I've got size 11 feet. Mm -hmm. These training shoes uh, were bright orange, OK? <laughs> so you've got a pair of size 11 bright orange training shoes <laughs> with the kind of rubber lip that curved around the front. It looked like I put my feet into giant cheesy watsits. <laughs> <laughs> and I trace my problems back to that very moment that I put them on. Who's because the I had a choice to make psychologically. Accept the fact these are wrong, <laughs> wear them and suffer the torment, or go out bravely saying, I'm right and you're wrong. And I was forced to make that choice. So is there anything you've ever seen in a shop and you think, I'm, I'm going to buy that? No, I won't. 
And then you, afterwards you've thought, I wish I'd bought that. There's one item, actually, which I can think of now, which, yeah. I, which torments me somewhat, mm -hmm. which was a Jean-Paul Gaultier. They only made a limited edition of these, and I saw it, and I thought, shall I buy it? Well, I probably won't get to wear it much, but it is rather attractive. <laughs> and I, and oh I went God. on and thought about it, and it was about 300 quid. I mean, yeah, I didn't, yeah. you know, it was the first yeah. time I was working. And I went back to the shop to buy this item, and they'd sold it. And it was a bowler hat with a big spike sticking out the top. <laughs> and I know I wouldn't have got a lot of wear out of it. <laughs> we just wearing it once or twice, would have given me so much pleasure. Paul, don't tell me you've tracked it down. Well, we've made one. Well, that's not the same. <laughs> oh, no, that is the same. <laughs> this is what it looked like. Did what it looked like? Yeah, but don't you see what I'm saying now? It's kind of handsome, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'll tell I mean, you what. It sort of does scream, look at me, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'll do a deal with you. If you want to take that away with you, you can but it would mean that we can't put your dress sense in the room 101. Oh, if yeah. we put your dress sense in the room 101, that's got to go in with it. What you're basically doing, this is like a version therapy, isn't it? Yeah. You're showing me what I want the most. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it. So if you can turn your back on that... You can have it if you want cured. it. You're cured. He's kind of handsome, though. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to live with your dress sense if you keep it. Just think of the little faces when I walk in the front door with this. <laughs> Gotta try it on. You know, I don't know if I dare, because <laughs> I think if it feels right, yeah. I won't take this off for a month. <laughs> Give a mirror. No, the audience will tell you if it suits you. <laughs> you will tell me if I look silly now, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> You're falling in love with it. It's quite a moment. I mean, just the concept of the bowler is nice enough, but that really sets it off to a tee. <laughs> Have a go. All right. Good. Looks good. What do you think? <laughs> Are you going to keep it? I'm so tempted, I can't begin to tell you. Yeah. Probably I'll have to get a car with a slightly higher roof. <laughs> <laughs> it's yours, but you've got to live with your dress sense if you keep it. Paul, I think you know the answer already. Yes, I do. I'm on the verge of tears, and I'm going to say to you, man to man, mm. you're a prince. <laughs> I'm keeping my clothes. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Ross. Yeah, now, what better way to end the show tonight than a clip from the popular children's television show Cracker Jack? So here's Peter Glaze, Don McLean, and Jan Hunt, electronically tagged and released from Room 101 for one night only. Until the next time, good night. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scatamoosh, scatamoosh, will you do the fandango? Thunderbolts and lightning. back for a new series on BBC Two in the